Welcome to the lecture series on digital voice and picture communication. This subject uh, has become a very important one in today's technology. Uh, we all are familiar with uh, the voice communication and picture communication uh, independently, but uh, I mean today the world has moved to such a kind of technological growth that in order to effectively and efficiently disseminate the information pertaining to voice, picture and the other medias which are there. Uh, very efficiently. So, there we need to use the digital technology. Now, we know that uh, the uh, uh, last century had two remarkable inventions. One is the telephony and the other is the television. Using the telephony, one was able to uh, transmit the voice signals from one place to the other. I mean overseas calls were made possible. I mean one could uh, directly talk to each other. That itself was a re remarkable discovery in those times and the television added one more dimensionality in the sense that where one could uh, um, have the picture transmission as well as with that the audio information is uh, there okay, in a synchronized form. Uh, of course, telephone was more like a one to one uh, communication, a personalized communication. Television was like a broadcast where the interactivity feature was not there. I mean the television stations are transmitting the uh, picture information along with the audio and uh, then we are receiving it in our uh, television receivers, no scope as such for the interaction. Uh, I mean even broadcast was possible over the speech and audio also in the sense of the discovery of the radio that really gave, gave rise to the voice communication uh, or the audio communication over long distances where we know that different modulation techniques that can be employed so that the uh, audio signal can be actually uh, uh, can actually modulate a carrier and then a long distance transmission is possible. We know about all this technology, but uh, I mean since uh, 1980s okay, uh, when the um, uh, computers were available in plenty and uh, especially the processing powers started uh, getting available at our desktops. The need was felt that uh, uh, how to uh, process the digital information pertaining to voice and uh, uh, picture. Picture of course would include both still pictures in the sense that which is not changing with respect to time and then the video uh, information which is changing with respect to time as well. Uh, voice as we uh, just understand by voice is the normal speech signal that we are using okay, for verbal communication. 
but uh, I, I mean when we require any high fidelity uh, audio like uh, I mean when we listen to any music a very high quality music that would require a different technology altogether in order to uh, I, I mean uh, process the audio information very efficiently. Now when the digital technology uh, came in that time we had to um, uh, I mean really go in for a different technology as such okay, in order to efficiently digitize and uh, uh, then uh, represent the information. So in this course this is what we are going to study. So we are going to see the technological aspect of it and uh, we will see that how efficiently the voice and uh, picture information can be represented and transmitted from one place to the other. So this is what concerns us and we will be understanding the technological aspect of this in this course. So this course as such uh, will have uh, some distinct modules. Okay. We will begin this course with the processing of speech information. So the first is the speech with which we will start and uh, in order to uh, efficiently represent the speech okay, what we need to do is to efficiently compress the signal. Okay. We know one thing that uh, the speech signal as such uh, um, has, is normally um, uh, I mean restricted to a bandwidth within 3.4 kilohertz. 3.4 kilohertz is I mean 0 to 3.4 kilohertz is a uh, bandwidth that we require for speech. So if we want to digitize speech signal then we naturally have to sample the speech signal at a rate which is uh, at least equal to or a little higher than the Nyquist sampling rate. So given by that 3.4 kilohertz signal would require uh, something more than uh, 6.8 kilohertz of sampling rate and the sampling rate which is normally utilized in the digital uh, speech processing is 8 kilohertz. So we require 8 kilohertz of sampling and if we go in for a regular pulse code modulation technique okay, and we represent the uh, speech samples, each speech sample if we represent by 8 bits per sample then that would require uh, I mean since the sampling rate itself is 8 kilohertz we will be requiring 8 multiplied by 8 that is a bit rate which is equal to 64 kilobits per second. So 64 kilobits per second will be the PCM or pulse code modulation requirement considering 8 bits per sample. Now 64 kilobits per second is uh, something which uh, I mean okay the uh, least lines can provide you very easily a bandwidth equal to 64 kilobits per second but uh, there are applications or there are situations when we need to compress the information even further. Uh, I mean, I mean uh, although the uh, bandwidth efficiency is increasing and the availability of bandwidth I mean today we have uh, 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 broadband availability uh, very easily but yet you also consider that the number of uh, users that has increased many folds. Okay. So as a result of that I mean no matter whatever effort you may make to increase your bandwidth okay, at the same time the number of users are also increasing uh, day by day and uh, what you have to always remain concerned is that what is the uh, amount of uh, bandwidth that will be ultimately available for each of the individual signals or for each individual application and that is generally very restricted and it, it can be restricted due to many situations. I mean uh, your uh, uh, ch channel capacity may be the limiting factor. Okay. The medium which you are using for transmission I mean 
naturally for uh, wire line transmission and for wire less transmission you are going to have different uh, bandwidth requirements. So, going by that you um, uh, have a requirement to reduce the uh, bit rate uh, further uh, drastically. So, the um, uh, pulse code modulation technique that we can think of okay, as a very um, uh, easy and simple representation of the speech samples okay, that needs to be augmented further. So, there were many speech coding techniques which were developed I mean uh, in, in the 80s, 90s and even a uh, lot of research is there um, uh, till today also that where efficient speech coding techniques are getting developed. Now, speech coding techniques as such we can divide into two broad categories. The first that we will be studying will be the waveform approximation coding. And the other that we are going to learn after waveform approximation coding is what is called as the parametric coding. Now, as the name implies the waveform approximation coding means that whenever you have any waveform be it speech or I mean the uh, signal com can come from any input okay, and it is a time varying signal. So, we consider any type of a uh, signal that is varying with respect to time and that can be approximated okay, using some waveform standard waveform coding techniques. Okay. So, waveform approximation coding well you have a variety of such coding techniques which are available. Now, PCM as I told you is the basic representation, but if instead of PCM for example, we uh, do some kind of a prediction of the signal like whatever is coming as an incoming signal, okay, if we are able to predict what it is going to be, how to predict? We simply use the previous samples. So, using the previous samples if we can generate a predicted signal. So, we have a predicted signal and then we have the original signal. So, you take the difference between these two. So, take this with a plus sign, take this with a minus sign. So, what you have as the difference is the differential signal or what you can also call as the prediction error. So, this differential signal what is available to you you can then use a pulse code modulation technique on this differential signal. So, you are going to call that technique as the differential pulse code modulation or in short form you are going to call this as DPCM. Now, this is one such technique. Okay. There are many other techniques which we will come across while discussing about the waveform approximation coding. Uh, some of them are very efficient ones. We will be talking about the uh, regular differential pulse code modulation scheme. We will see how to make that process adaptive and we will talk about the adaptive differential pulse code modulation scheme or the ADPCM. We will also learn about the delta modulation which in short form we call as DM uh, where sample by sample we just quantize it to one of the two levels. Again the differential uh, the, again this um, delta modulation one can uh, use with an adaptive control over its step size. So, one can have an adaptive delta modulation or called as ADM. So, uh, there are many such waveform coding uh, approximation coding techniques which are available. Now, uh, I was telling that all these things can be applied to speech signals even for other time varying signals also. So, there is nothing speciality about the speech that we can talk of I mean as far as these uh, waveform approximation coding techniques are concerned. 
you can apply for speech just like the way you can apply for any other varieties of signals be it uh, I mean biomedical signal be it uh, any uh, one dimensional uh, signal coming from other sensors okay you can very easily use that there is nothing particular to speech that you are using but whereas the next te technique the next group of techniques which we are going to learn that is to say in parametric coding as the name implies that parametric word has come from parameters. So, what we do is that the speech signal is represented in terms of certain parameters. So, if it is possible to extract a set of parameters from the speech, okay, which can characterize the speech information completely or at least we can say reasonably, then what one can do is that instead of sending the uh, um, uh, waveform approximated signal or its differential form or, what, or, or I mean whatever, okay. instead of that you only send the parameters and using these those parameters if the uh, I mean if, if at the decoder end or at the receiver end one is able to extract the parameter and reproduce in the same way as uh, that of the uh, I, 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 I mean as the technique which was used to uh, extract the parameters, you just do a reversal of that. So, using those parameters you synthesize the speech signal. So, if you can do that, then uh, that requires much less information to re, uh, much less number of bits to represent that information as compared to what you would be doing normally with the waveform approximation. So, definitely if 64 kilobits per second is the reference that we use for the pulse code modulation, one can come down to a bit rate of 16 kilobits per second or let us say uh, uh, 9.6 kilobits per second, some, uh, some kind of rates like that one can uh, have using efficient waveform approximation coding techniques. But if you want to uh, reduce your bit rate further in a very drastic way, then you have to go in for uh, something like a parametric coding technique. So, there I mean because it is parameters that can be more efficiently represented. So, we will be studying I mean under the speech coding techniques we will be studying both these aspects that is waveform approximation as well as parametric. Next we come to the uh, image coding techniques. In image coding, uh, actually uh, uh, image is a different form of signal in the sense that speech is uh, a one dimensional signal, there the variation of the speech signal is only with respect to time, whereas in case of images it is a two dimensional signal. I mean whereas uh, speech signal we can called as x of t, where t is the time with respect to which the signal x is changing. For the images, we have to take the uh, signal as a two dimension. So, we represent the image intensity by a function f and we call this as a function of x and y, where x and y are nothing but the spatial directions. So, x we can take as the horizontal direction and y we can take as the vertical direction. So, uh, using this x and the y coordinates, okay, you can specify that which particular uh, point in the uh, entire image that you are looking for. Now, here it is digital, I mean just like the way the speech also in order to process in the computer we uh, require sampling and after sampling we require a digitization and then it is the processing of the digitized speech samples that we are considering. In a very similar way images also are to be digitized and the image signal which will be coming from the camera that has to be represented in a two dimensional form by uh, proper uh, uh, what what you say uh, by um, uh, by 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 sampling the image information on a grid, okay. 
So, grid means something like this that supposing the grid spacing is this say these are the spacings of the grids that we use horizontally and these are the spacings of the grids okay, which is uh, in the vertical direction we show the grids like this. So, it is a, an array of uh, uh, picture elements that we form. So, we call those array of picture elements as pixels okay, and those pixels are nothing but the intensity as you find at the grid location. So, at all these grid intersections, the intensity that you have are nothing but the samples of the image. Okay. So, it is a two dimensional sampling that you have and as you can very well understand that uh, closer your grid spacings are, okay, better will be your resolution with which you are representing the pixels in an image. Okay. And then again, if the question is asked that how to decide on the spacings of these samples or rather to say the grid spacings, for that matter also we have to go in for the Nyquist rate. Just like the way for time varying signals, we have a uh, maximum bandwidth which is available or we rather band restrict the signals before digitization. Okay. There for the uh, speech it was 3.4 kilohertz. In this case, the, um, uh, the bandwidth or the frequency content that we are going to talk of is the spatial frequency. So, here it is a variation with respect to space and again it will be having two components of variations, one is along the x and the other is along the y. So, uh, depending upon your spatial frequency content, you have to decide your sampling frequency. In this case, the sampling frequency also will have the, uh, will, will, will have to be uh, in terms of the distance or inter sampling distance, right. So, if your frequency content is more, obviously you need to sample uh, much, uh, I mean in a much finer way, you need to have more samples within one unit length. So, this is uh, where we, we will be ultimately finding that the image signals will require a uh, lot of information to represent, even a single image just you imagine that which can be, I mean let us take a very typical size, say we take a grid of 256 by 256 image samples. So, which means to say that there are 64 kilo samples in an image or you call it as picture. Now, each of these samples can be represented by 8 bits of re uh, representation for intensity. So, if we have 8 bits for intensity, then we have the intensity levels between 0 to 255, where 0 will be the darkest intensity or it is the uh, minimum intensity, the blackest one and 255 will correspond to the maximum brightness. So, it is the extreme white pixel will be having intensity of 255 and in between it is uh, intensity variation will take place within the range of 0 to 255. So, uh, something like mid range 127 or 128 intensity equal to 127, 128 you can say as a gray that is something which is in between the black and the white and if it is slightly above somewhat above 128 or uh, then you can say that okay, it is a gray image, but closer to a white. If it is 64 you say it is a gray image but closer to black. So, we call everything as the gray scale, but if you have to transmit the image information from one place to the other, okay, just think over that uh, how much of uh, that how many bits you require. 256 by 256 example 64 kilo samples and each sample requiring 8 bits per sample. 
so 8 bits per sample. So, which means to say that you have got 512 kilobits of information for every image. Now, you can say that okay, I mean let me take my own time, if the bandwidth is restricted so what I will be transmitting my image slower. Well, all the time you cannot do it and you cannot do it for all applications. Like say for example, supposing a medical conferencing is going on, okay. some doctors they have met over a video conferencing and they are located at different uh, uh, geographical locations on the globe. I mean one doctor may be in India, one doctor may be in uh, UK, another doctor may be in Australia, somebody may be in USA. So, we have them distributed all over the world. Now, whenever we are transmitting an image to them naturally, I mean some decision making is to be made based on some medical images, uh, okay, maybe uh, that uh, the ultra ultrasonography image or maybe the x-ray image whatever. So, na naturally we have to transmit the image in a very efficient way, so that it can be encoded without appreciable uh, loss of time. So, naturally the computation time is at a premium that is one fact and the second is that uh, if we if you want to uh, I mean uh, uh, transmit the image within a very small time then you also require more number of bits to uh, transmit. So, you require more efficient bandwidth, but in order to do that you have to apply some very efficient coding techniques or very efficient way of compressing the information. Actually, I mean for uh, I, I mean the speech signal or for image signal, we luckily have lot of redundancy which is present. Now, think that why for the speech we were talking about a differential encoding, because successive samples of speech uh, happen to be somewhat correlated to e each other. I mean if we pick up a sample at some instant, the very next sample is not going to be very drastically different from the present sample. So, instead of representing the absolute magnitude of that sample, we say that we take the differential, why? Because the differential is going to have much uh, um, lower dynamic range. So, we require less number of bits to represent that. Same with the images, successive pixels okay, are going to have more or less very similar intensities. So, there also you can adopt various techniques in order to reduce the information content. First of all that you can use the same techniques like the differential pulse code modulation even for images also. Okay. Like say for example, one sample predicting the very next sample and then we represent the error content in that or otherwise we exploit the spatial redundancy in a different manner in the sense that we transform the image from the space uh, domain representation to a different domain where the representation is more compact, more energy efficient and we choose that kind of a scheme for image coding. We will be learning all these in this particular course. So, under the image coding we will be uh, learning about the different compression techniques and especially we will talk about the discrete cosine transform which is a very popular technique and has been adopted in the uh, standards in the image uh, coding standards that have uh, evolved okay, in a, uh, I mean, I mean internationally. So, DCT or discrete cosine transform we will be studying and also we will be studying about the discrete wavelet transforms, because wavelet is another very efficient way of representing the images, uh, where the image can be analyzed into a multi band uh, component and then each individual band can be efficiently uh, coded and this gives rise, uh, this gives us a flexibility that what is called as the space frequency localization. We can know that which particular spatial location of the image has got what uh, frequency uh, content 
and that can be very efficiently represented using the discrete wavelet transform. After the image coding, we will be coming to the topic of video coding. Now, the difference between image and video is just that in the case of image, the variation was only in space, okay. but in the case of video, the variation is uh, not only with respect to the x and the y directions that we considered for the images, but also with respect to time. So, here we have actually three dimensional signals in the sense that the image intensity f will not only be a function of x and y, but it will also be a function of time t. So, uh, in the case of video uh, signals, what we have to uh, take is that, I mean there will be a sequence which we capture from a video camera and the video camera normally captures the sequence at a very fast rate, fast rate in the sense that we are habituated to capture the video at 30 frames per second. Why uh, the rate of 30 frames per second? It is because uh, in video or in continuous motion case, I mean the same situation we also have uh, while uh, showing the movies or even for uh, uh, transmitting the television signals also, you, uh, since we have to give to the viewers a feeling of continuous motion, there should not be any jerkiness that is present in the um, playback of the information that we do. So, that is why the uh, rate at which a video frame is to be replenished should be uh, as good as possible. Now, we can say that why not, uh, why 30, why not 60 or why not uh, better than that? Well, I mean ultimately it is the human detector that uh, we have to consider because ultimately your eyes will be able to detect. So, if your eyes can uh, have a feeling of continuous motion at 30 frames per second, then why not restrict to 30 frames per second. Okay. Of course, people, people have managed with frame rates of 10 frames per second or uh, say 15 frames per second or I have read that in some applications, I mean where uh, I mean there is a severe bandwidth restrictions, people might have worked with 7.5 frames per second also. Now, okay, I mean if your frame rate is coming down like that, 10 frames per second or even below 7.5 frames per second, obviously you are going to have some amount of jerkiness in the motion content of the scene. But uh, nevertheless, 7.5 frames per second if you take then your information content is uh, also much less because in, in 30 frames per second within one second you have to transmit the content pertaining to 30 frames whereas here it is just one fourth of that 7.5 frames per second. Of course, definitely at a loss of perceptual quality. So, there is always uh, as we will be learning through this course also that there is always a kind of trade off that exists between the uh, representation of the information content and the quality that we are going to deliver. Okay. I mean we may be ultimately designing a very efficient scheme in terms of uh, bandwidth uh, utilization, but that may not be appealing uh, perceptually. So, then it is of no use. So, we have to always make a good trade off that without uh, severe perceptual degradation, okay, how efficiently you can uh, encode. That is the challenge, that is the challenge with which all these techniques are developed. Now, I was telling you about the image coding aspects that where, whereas in the case of image coding, we have the spatial variations, okay, variation with respect to the x and the y. In the case of video, there is also a temporal variation. So, there is spatial as well as temporal variation and in both these dimensions, the spatial dimensions as well as in temporal dimension, we have lot of redundancy. Spatial we can definitely understand that 
given one frame the uh, pixel intensities are not going to change drastically between the neighboring pixels unless it is at the uh, I mean uh, I mean at some uh, edge of some object I mean boundary between some object and the background okay there are some drastic uh, change in the intensity is possible okay but as long as you are moving within smooth areas of the image okay so some uniformly lit object that is not going to uh, change the intensity drastically I mean from one neighbor to the other and same is the case with the temporal aspect also that if we capture a frame now okay, and if we are maintaining 30 frames per second as the uh, frame uh, refreshment rate or the rate at which the frames arrive. So, the very next frame we are representing like this then the very next frame we we'll, uh, 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 just keep it here. So, this is the stack of frame. So, this is our time dimension whereas, here the variation is with respect to x and y. So, we have the space variation within one frame time variation across the frame. So, if we call this frame as the nth frame then we will be calling this as the next frame or n plus 1 th frame this as n plus 2 th frame, this as n plus 3 th frame and so on. Now, within successive frames we have at 30 frames per second we have a gap of only 1 30th of a second. So, in 1 30th of a second uh, or rather, rather to say 30 milliseconds how much change can be there. After all you are taking the pictures mostly of real world objects and real world objects are not going to move that drastically sometimes they may but most of the times you can say that in 1 30th of second there is not significant movement there is marginal movement so at least we can use some kind of a differential technique over time which means to say that even if we apply uh, any uh, transformation techniques to consider the variation in space very efficiently, we can use a differential technique to consider the variation against time which results in some kind of a hybrid encoding scheme that is to say having a differential pulse code modulation temporally and having a uh, uh, transformation techniques like the DCT or the DWT to encode the error that results out of that prediction. So, what you can do is that from the nth frame you can predict the n plus 1 nth frame okay. take the difference between your predicted and the original n plus 1 nth frame okay. take the error signal of that error or the differential signal of that and then that differential signal will be having some variation with respect to space okay, which you can exploit very well I mean the correlation that exists along the spatial dimensions that can be exploited using uh, the techniques like the DCT wavelets and all others. So, we will be learning about the video coding techniques also in details and subsequent to that in this course we will uh, also come to the um, uh, question of how to efficiently encode the audio. Now, again we are making a distinction between speech and audio speech is something that is a simple voice quality signal which is restricted to 3.4 kilohertz. Now, if you get a channel of uh, bandwidth which can just accommodate the speech samples obviously, the same bandwidth will not be able to cater for uh, the uh, I mean any high quality audio say music say some uh, high fidelity musical instrument is going on and then uh, we, we will not be able to use uh, the channel I mean the uh, I, I, I mean the, the channel which can be used for speech okay, will not be good for uh, music. Okay. So, here for audio we have to make use of the entire audio frequency spectrum which we consider as 0 to 20 kilohertz okay i mean people say 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz 
So your signal may be all the way up to 20 kilohertz. So in order to, uh, I mean, uh, sample this signal, okay, again you have to fulfill the Nyquist rate. So you have to sample it at a rate which is higher than 20 kilohertz and the usual practice is to use 44 kilohertz as the sampling rate. So with 44 kilohertz of sampling rate, you have to uh, sample the audio signal. Audio signal is like speech, it is a time varying signal only, but the rate at which it is sampled is 44 instead of 8 kilohertz which is for speech. So definitely the audio information content is going to be much higher. And um, again, uh, for audio, we require a, um, a stereo quality in many of the um, cases, like for efficient uh, uh, recording of audio or for efficient playback, I mean, in order to uh, ensure that it is more appealing to our ears, we go in for stereo channels which means to say that we have 16 samples uh, or 16 bits we take per sample, where we consider 8 bits per sample for each of the channels. So, 8 bits per sample okay, for each channel into 2 channels. So, obviously, it leads to 16 bits per sample and 16 bits per sample with 44 kilohertz is definitely a bandwidth which is considerably high and we need to adopt good efficient techniques for uh, the audio coding also. And in case of audio coding, actually um, uh, there uh, some characteristic of audios are very efficiently utilized. So instead of going in for the standard waveform based uh, coding techniques, okay. one uh, considers uh, some psychoacoustic behavior. The psychoacoustic behavior has been very widely studied okay. and based on the psychoacoustic observations, it has been found that if we have the presence of a very strong signal at some frequency, let us say that at 5 kilohertz we have the presence of a very strong signal. In that case, it is seen that this very strong signal tends to mask off the other audio signals which are there in the vicinity of this frequency. So there is some kind of a masking characteristic that uh, I mean beyond this uh, 5 kilohertz or close to this 5 kilohertz, there is some kind of a masking effect which gradually tapers off. So if we have another audio component at 1 kilohertz, that may not be masked off. Or if we have something at 10 kilohertz, that is also far off from this 5 kilohertz component. But if we have something which is 4.9 kilohertz, definitely the 4.9 kilohertz is very close to the 5 kilohertz strong audio signal which is present and this 4.9 may be masked off or 5.1 may be masked off. So what we do is that we uh, make a complete tonal analysis and then find out that what is the uh, I mean amount of uh, uh, what you say, I mean what is the masking uh, effect uh, I mean for, uh, at, at a particular frequency. I mean when there are strong tonal components which are present, what is the overall masking effect so that we allocate the bits considering those masking effects. This also we will be studying and there definitely we have to consider the psychoacoustic phenomenon into consideration which has been actually incorporated in the audio coding standards. And after going through the audio coding which is the fourth topic, fourth major module in our uh, course content, we, the next uh, topic that we will be considering is the actual uh, uh, communication of the signal. Now, like uh, what, what we uh, mean here is that how the speech 
and the uh, speech, audio, video, this can be uh, exchanged, okay. how this information can be exchanged from uh, one test to the other. Now, uh, there we considered the networking aspect that uh, if we have to um, um, send the information from one test to the other or if we have a kind of a conferencing like uh, one uh, terminal uh, uh, say multiple terminals have entered into a kind of an audio conferencing or in a video conferencing there the exchange of information has to continuously take place. So, then what is the requirement of such networks, okay. what are the protocols that come in. So, we, we will be I mean our fifth topic in this course will be the voice over IP, voice over internet protocol and in that we will be stressing on the uh, networking and especially there we have to study the uh, signaling requirements which is given by the H.323 standard. Okay. So, we will be covering the voice over IP with respect to the uh, standard protocols. H.323 basically gives you the protocols for voice over IP. Now, what has happened is that slowly uh, the uh, networking has encroached. I mean already the networking has encroached uh, our uh, day to day life to such an extent that we will be uh, having a mixture of the traditional uh, communication devices and the network communication devices. Like uh, voice over IP we uh, use for the telephonic purpose, I mean where the voice communication will go through the internet backbone rather than going through the normal telephone lines okay. and it will be completely digitally processed. I mean uh, from the source it is digitally processed and then it is sent over the packets and the packets are uh, delivered to the destination. Uh, the, whereas in the case, uh, whereas people also uh, still use the traditional uh, um, uh, telephones for voice communication. So, you have a combination of the voice over IP telephones and also the uh, public switch telephone network or PSTN terminals also available. So, there needs to be some kind of an interface between PSTN and VOIP so that there is no barrier as such. A VOIP user should be able to uh, talk to a PSTN user very easily just like the way a PSTN user also can initiate a call and talk to a VOIP user. Uh, in a very easy and in a transparent manner, no matter I mean wherever the users are, whether they are in the VOIP domain or PSTN domain, a very easy access should be there. So, this aspect we will be talking of when we talk of the, uh, the voice over IP. And then we will come to the um, last topic in our uh, subject which is the video conferencing. So, voice over IP is for the voice transmission mostly, but of course, the VOIP techniques can be used for the video uh, signaling as well. But voice, uh, but video conferencing actually video conferencing techniques also is going through a, a change in era. I mean when video conferencing first uh, came in, then uh, it uh, was uh, made possible over uh, dedicated communication channels. I mean it was uh, uh, possible through achieve video conferencing through the ISD and the integrated services digital network. Uh, and uh, uh, slowly now the, the situation is changing with the uh, I mean easy availability of internet backbone. Uh, now I, I mean the video conferencing is also uh, becoming popular over the IP based network. So, there are uh, some efficient protocols to support that which is the session initiation protocol or what is called as the SIP protocol which also we will be studying under the video conferencing. So, we will study the ISDN based video conferencing also 
we will talk about the IP based video conferencing, especially the aspects of SIP protocol and also I mean in, 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 in our last lecture possibly we will try to cover about the wireless video conferencing also, which will be the uh, future in the coming days. So, this is the broad outline of our course that we will be having in a nutshell, we will be having speech coding techniques, we will be having, uh, we will be studying about the image coding, we will be studying about the video coding, voice over IP and uh, now audio coding in between, voice over IP, video conferencing. So, that easily takes uh, 40 lectures for us in which we will be able to give you some comprehensive coverage of the technology that is in use for the digital voice and picture communication. So, we will actually be starting with the speech coding in the, I mean from the next class onwards. Okay. Uh, so, maybe that uh, uh, today I can give you some idea about the reference materials that uh, would uh, help you to some extent. So, for speech there are some many good books which are available. So, I can recommend some of these uh, books for you, so that uh, your understanding can be better if you listen to these lectures uh, uh, along with uh, reading some reference books. So, one very popular book is Digital Processing of Speech Signals by Rabiner. So, this is the title and this is by Rabinar L R okay. and another book you can refer to principles of computer speech. This is by Witten. Then you can also refer to a more recent book. It is Digital Speech Coding for Low Bitrate Communication Systems. This is by Kondos This is actually a John Willey publication book and another interesting book is a practical handbook of speech coders. by R. Goldberg and L. Rick. <coughs> so, we will begin with the <coughs> topic from the next class. So, first I will present the speech processing uh, or rather to say the speech generation models. So, for this we need to study uh, some physiological uh, aspects of speech generation process, because only if we understand the speech generation process properly, then we will be able to efficiently represent the parameters which are associated with speech. So, we will start with the speech generation and then after the speech generation and finding out the speech generation models for that, 
we will go further into the speech coding aspects. Thank you.